Hello and welcome to STEM with Mr N, where every week I'll be performing different demonstrations and explaining the science behind what we're seeing. This week I got some assistance from the science advisor on the new Jurassic World film, so we have a special guest expert helping us to explore our topic this week, fossils. Let's check it out. Last week, I contacted Professor Steve Brusatti, who is a professor of paleontology and evolution at Edinburgh University, the author of the terrific Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, and a science advisor on the next Jurassic World film. I was asking if we could get some expert advice for this week's video. Well, Professor Brusatti put me in touch with one of the PhD researchers that he works with at Edinburgh University. So this week, we have a special guest expert, Paige DiPolo. It is likely that most of you will be familiar with fossils, but might not know exactly what they are. To explain a bit more about fossils and what it's like looking for them, we have our guest expert, Paige. A fossil is, most fundamentally, evidence of ancient life. There are many, many different types of fossils, from the millions of different living things that have existed on Earth through time. And I'll talk about two broad categories here, body fossils and trace fossils. Body fossils are the preserved remains of a living organism. They can include bones, teeth, shells, the exoskeletons of insects, and the leaves of plants and trees. Some body fossils, like the trunks of trees and the leg bones from sauropods, long-necked dinosaurs, can be bigger than humans. Other body fossils, like these tiny radiolarians that used to float in the ancient oceans, are so small that we need special microscopes to see them. Body fossils are special because they help us figure out what ancient plants and animals might have looked like, and how they might be related to one another. Trace fossils, on the other hand, are more indirect evidence of ancient life. They include footprints, burrows, and tooth marks. These fossils give evidence of how ancient animals may have behaved and interacted with their environment and one another. Every fossil, no matter how small or broken up, is a miracle. Of the mind-boggling number of organisms that have lived on Earth, a very small fraction actually make it through the process of becoming a fossil. In the case of an animal, like a dinosaur, the fossilization process usually necessitates its bones being buried quickly, so they can't be eaten up by scavengers or broken down by microbes and bacteria. Then, as the sediments around the bones are buried deeper and begin to turn into rocks, the organic material in the bones is replaced by minerals from the surrounding sediments. Then the rocks the fossils are in have to be brought back to the surface through both weathering, the rocks above them being worn away, and tectonics, changes in what the earth looks like caused by the movement of its plates. Then the fossils have to be found and recognized as special by people. There are many, many steps to a fossil being preserved. One of the coolest things for me when I uncover a fossil outside is realizing that I'm the first human to ever see that particular piece of the puzzle. It's a mind-bending idea. I feel very lucky to get to find and work on fossils. I'm interested in understanding how ancient animals interacted with their environments. As a paleontologist, it feels like I spend a lot of my time trying to find and organize the pieces of an enormous puzzle. I love it when I realize I've collected enough data to begin telling the stories of animals that lived millions of years ago. The first demonstration this week is going to model the fossilization process. For this demonstration, I'm using two different types of bread and some jelly beans. Now when an animal dies, its body often gets washed into a riverbed or down into the sea. So this first piece of bread is going to be the riverbed. I'm going to use some jelly beans to be the bodies of different animals. Now over time, more sand and dirt will get washed into the riverbeds or washed into the sea and cover over the bodies of these animals. So we're going to add some sand and soil with our second slice of bread. Now even more time, more sand and soil will get added on top of that. So I'm back to my first type of bread. And then more sand and soil continues to get washed on. What you're going to do is take all of these slices of bread and put them inside a sandwich bag. Now 
Over time, the pressure of all the sand and soil building up, as well as heat rising from the earth, turns all the sand and soil into rocks. To represent this part of the process, you're going to take a couple of heavy books or just something heavy you've got at home and sit it on top of all of your bread and leave it sitting like that for a day or two. After a day or two, take your bread out from underneath the heavy books or whatever you had sitting on top of them, take the bread out of the bag and we are going to explore the layers that we built up and see what happened to the bodies that we put on the bottom layer of bread to turn them into fossils. To explore the layers, you're going to need a clear plastic straw or something similar. I'm using an empty syringe and we're going to put it on top of the bread and press down hard until we go through all of the layers of bread. When you pull it back up, you should see the different layers inside your clear plastic straw, your syringe or whatever it is you're using. This shows how sand and soil build up over time and create layers of rock. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try and peel apart our slices of bread until we get down to where those bodies are that we buried and see what's happened to them in terms of turning into fossils. Now over time, the flesh of the dead animals will get eaten by other animals or bacteria and stripped away. And you'll notice that on our bottom slice of bread, the shell that was on the outside of the jelly beans has also been stripped away and we're left with the white inside of the jelly beans. You'll also notice on the slice of bread that was on top of the jelly beans that you've got these dents in the bread where the jelly bean was. This is called a mould fossil because the ground there has moulded to the shape of the body. You'll also notice around the jelly beans and in the holes that the colour of the jelly bean has seeped into the bread. Over time, as the flesh of an animal gets stripped away, the bones might also decay and completely disappear. But what happens then is minerals come in and fill in the gaps where the bones were and this creates cast fossils. These coloured parts on the bread are where other minerals have crept into the rock and made cast fossils. Our next demonstration is going to explore what sort of land is the best for creating cast fossils. I've got some sand and I've got some soil and I'm going to spoon these into some different tubs. So I've got one tub here which is just for sand. Once the sand's in, I'm just going to smooth off the top of that. I have another tub, which is for sand and soil mixed. You want to make sure in the tub with sand and soil that they get really well mixed together. Once they're in and mixed, I'm going to smooth that off. And our last tub is just for soil on its own. And again, once that's in, you just want to smooth off the top of it. For the next part of the demonstration, I'm going to press a shell down into the top of each of these types of ground and then use a set of tweezers to carefully take the shell back out. The last step in the process is I'm going to mix together some plaster of Paris and pour it into the top of each of these tubs to fill up the impression that we made with our shell. We'll be looking to see which one of these types of ground preserves the ridges of the shell the best. Make sure and read the instructions of the plaster you are using so that you know how long you need to leave them to sit until they're set. I've left my plaster for about an hour so I know that it is nice and hard. I've used a knife to go round the edges of the plaster to be able to separate it from the tub and that means I'm just going to be able to easily lift them out. Now when I take them out, they're likely to still have sand or soil covering the bottom of them. So if you've got something to clean them up with, like an old toothbrush, that will help see the cast that we have made. And you can see on the sand one, we've got a little bit of detail from the ridges from the shell. The soil on the sand one's been a lot harder to clean up, but you might be able to see there that it's quite clear there's even more detail in the one with the soil and sand than there is with just the sand. So the one in just the soil was even harder again to clean up than the previous two. This is because there's a lot more detail on this cast than there was on the other two. A lot more ridges of the shell have come through, but also the lumps and bumps of the ground round about. That meant there's been lots of small bits to try and dig into to clean out the dirt, but it seems to have made the best cast fossil. This is because that tub was more damp than the other two. Now dinosaurs spent most of their time in swampy marshy land that was very damp, and that is why we have lots of traces of dinosaurs left behind. 
Now our guest expert Paige is going to give some advice to anyone out there who's interested in becoming a paleontologist. Are you interested in becoming a paleontologist when you grow up? One of the things that I think is really important to emphasize to folks is that paleontology really has a place for everyone. I think that one of the challenges that paleontologists face currently is that our image to the rest of the world is as people who spend a lot of time tromping around in remote places looking for fossils. And I have to be careful here because personally, that sort of field work is my favorite part of the job. If you like being outside, camping with your family, being strong while playing sports, or exploring new places, then there is absolutely a place for you in paleontology. But those people who go out to find new fossils aren't the only people who we need to be paleontologists. If you like science, physics, chemistry, biology, there is a place for you in paleontology. If you like learning facts about animals, plants, rocks, and the world, there is a place for you in paleontology. If you are good at math or building machines or working on computers, there is a place for you in paleontology. If you love to write stories and enjoy words and language, or if you're an artist and enjoy being creative or drawing, there is a place for you in paleontology. If you are very good at organizing things and keeping track of all your notes, there is a place for you in paleontology. One of my favorite things about paleontology is that whatever talents or skills a person has, they can be used to do cool science in this discipline. Whoever you are, whatever you are good at and love to do, there is a place for those gifts in paleontology. Right now, the most important thing you can be doing to become a paleontologist is your best at school in all your subjects. Try to be learning as much as you can about all the different things in the world. Find friends who are interested in the natural world as well, and share cool stories with one another. If you can get good at fundamental skills, like math and writing, you'll see lots of different doors opening up. Don't be scared to help your friends with those skills too, or ask for help if you need it. Paleontology needs people who are kind and work together. To be a professional paleontologist, you'll likely need to go to university after you leave school and study a subject like geology or biology and you might even end up wanting to do postgraduate study. That's where I'm at in my career. I'm still being formally trained. And if you don't want to be a paleontologist full-time, but you still love fossils, paleontology also needs you as an amateur scientist. These are people who have other jobs and maybe only are able to focus on fossils during their free time. One of my friends and research collaborators lives on the Isle of Skye works as a builder and crofter, and is one of the most important and knowledgeable people for Scottish fossils in the world. Even if you end up working a different job, you can still help out with paleontology. There is so much to still be figured out about what the world was like millions of years ago. Well, that's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, like and subscribe and share the video with your friends. A big thank you to my special guest this week, Paige DiPolo, and also to Professor Steve Brusatti for putting us in touch. If you're interested in dinosaurs, I would thoroughly recommend Professor Brusatti's book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. In it, he talks about his own fossil hunting, dinosaur discoveries, and recent research. I've included a couple of links in the description, one of which is to a radio interview that Paige and Professor Brusatti have done about their own recent research, and another is to the Pal Alba Consortium, a group of paleontologists dedicated to researching and preserving Scotland's fossil record. I've also included credits for photographs used during Paige's segment that were not taken by her. As always, I would like to take this opportunity to answer any science questions you have about any science topics at all. So feel free to email me at stemwithmrn at outlook.com and I'll get back to you with answers to your questions. And look out this Friday for our first questions video. This has been STEM with Mr. N, exploring fossils.